COVID-19. 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 In December of 2019, a fatal virus began developing in Wuhan, China. The world erupted. Some suspected it was nothing to be concerned about. Others began to fret for their lives. But no one could have expected that it would grow into the mass world crisis that it became. The virus spread to Europe, then to the United States. It overtook the world. Governments worked hard to prevent the spread. Yet, in the midst of these hard, trying circumstances, there is one message that has fought off fear and division and kept people together. That message is that in the midst of darkness, we still have hope. Let's take a step back and follow the story of how we got here. It all started in Wuhan when Li Wenliang, an ophthalmologist at Wuhan Central Hospital, warned health officials that there was a virus similar to SARS emerging. Sadly, he was silenced by the Chinese government for unnecessary rumors, and eventually Li himself died of the virus he warned the world of. It wasn't long before the Chinese government saw their error and began responding. They closed the Huanan seafood market, where the virus may have entered the public, whether through an animal or something else, and the city of Wuhan locked down on January 10th, 23rd of 2020. Despite these belated measures, people could not stop the virus from spreading through travel, as people traveling from China for the new year arrived home from plane or boat. The first case in Europe appeared on January 24th. The virus had been in the news for a while, but some were skeptical and didn't want to worry. However, things escalated after the coronavirus spread in the United States from a Chicago resident who had visited China to her husband. After this, the U.S. declared a public health emergency. In February, the first person outside China died of the coronavirus, and the World Health Organization officially named the new strain of coronavirus COVID-19. Soon after, the whole country of Italy came under lockdown. The virus spread in the Middle East, in Latin America, and beyond. Back in the U.S., things got heated. The government implemented travel bans to prevent the spread. The CDC began recommending limitations of gatherings of 50 or more, and the U.S. declared a national emergency. Things got worse. The number of cases kept climbing, and the death toll was rising. Nevertheless, the United States government stepped up, passing a $2 trillion stimulus package to help struggling Americans by providing medical aid and, for many citizens, a $1,200 check to provide help in this time. Throughout the month of March, testing went out, which had some struggles at first, as it was hard to distribute tests and many were ineffective. In addition, gatherings of 10 or more were restricted and many states implemented harsh social distancing laws to quell the virus. However, also at this time, the New York area underwent extreme conditions of the pandemic and suffered substantially as the virus was shown to be more deadly than expected when a one-year-old died in Chicago from the virus. In April, the number of cases climbed to over one million and the number of deaths reached around 200,000. The CDC recommended many more guidelines to prevent the virus from spreading, including the wearing of gloves and having everyone, not just healthcare workers, wear masks. Companies rushed to research the virus and find a vaccine. Testing increased. Thousands of Americans became jobless. Nations and people worked hard to flatten the curve of the exponentially growing virus, and people wondered when it would end. COVID-19 has brought the world on a ride that no one signed up for. It has challenged governments, caused heartache, questioned authority, and affected everyone. The reason this virus is so scary 
is because it is brand new. No one knows what's going on. Many were just diagnosed with pneumonia at the start. As time went on, though, people began to understand the virus more, and the CDC now leads the charge in informing the American people about the virus. Some of the symptoms are found to be coughing, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, uh, and can now include chills, uh, repeated shaking with chills, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, and a new loss of taste or smell. The concerning thing, though, is that many people can have the virus and not know it. Asymptomatic. As the symptoms develop between two and 14 days. And so the virus spreads more and more rapidly if people aren't careful. I had the opportunity to speak with Dr. Gerald Parker from Texas A&M, who has a history in biodefense and public health and preparedness about the topic of the coronavirus and its effects on the world. I'm uh, Dr. Jerry Parker from Texas A&M University. All righty. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so I guess you know a lot about the current virus and you're doing a lot in it. A little bit. Yes, <laughs> and, yeah, a little bit. A little, a little bit about my background for the record for your... Um, so I've spent my career in biodefense, public health preparedness, health security, uh, from the research to the policy level. And um, I've um, certainly been concerned about a, uh, an emerging infectious disease, disease with pandemic potential. And unfortunately, here we are. Um, we have a crisis on our hand. We have a public health emergency. Um, it has started, um, well, it started in Wuhan, China, and it's spread around the world, and it is unfectively um, causing um, a lot of problems for a lot of people around the world, and including our own communities here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we will get through it. Yes. Yes, we will. That is the hope we have during all mm -hmm. this thing. Um, so I guess let's start out. What exactly is the coronavirus? So the coronavirus is actually... Um, it's an it's an RNA virus, which is just you know it's a jargon in the virology world, but it's a a virus that um, it's a novel new coronavirus. But there are other coronaviruses. In fact, uh, there are four strains of coronaviruses that are associated with a common cold. Um, but there have been two coronaviruses since uh, 2002 that have emerged. Um, but most likely from bats uh, that have jumped from an intermediate host into humans that have been associated with very serious disease. And so in addition to the, you know, the coronaviruses that uh, associated with a common cold, which um, nobody likes to get the common cold, that makes us feel really bad for a couple of weeks, uh, but we get through it. Um, but um, the first novel coronavirus that was associated with serious disease was called the SARS virus. And that, uh, that emerged in, in Asia uh, in 2002 and um, ultimately killed about 800 people, um, caused $80 billion in economic impact around the world. I've forgotten how many countries it, it uh, traveled to, but it, it, doesn't, it didn't, um, it, it was not a pandemic. It was a regional epidemic, but it did travel to several countries. Canada most most um, um, was hit fairly hard uh, with uh, the SARS virus, um, and it had a it had a relatively high case mortality rate. Uh, but we were the, the public health and the global community was able to contain that virus, and we haven't seen it again. Um, so that virus has gone away, uh, other than in laboratories where we have continued scientists have continued to study that that virus in hopes of learning more about its viral ecology, how it transmits from, from bats to another animal than to humans and, mm -hmm. and continued some work on diagnostics. But we had another dangerous coronavirus emerge, um, I think in 2012, but in the late uh, 2010s in, the, in this decade, uh, out, of, out of the Middle East. And it's called Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or MERS. And um, we, we um, sporadically see cases of MERS still, 
it's associated with um, the, 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 actually the animal reservoir now may be the camel, uh, but occasionally it spills over into humans. Um, and so sporadically we do see cases of MERS in the Middle East. And occasionally we see travel related cases of MERS. And the, the, the one that was most significant was in 2015 in Seoul. And it was a travel related um, case. Uh, so it went from the Middle East to Seoul, Korea and um, a, a chain of disease uh, viral transmission began to happen, particularly in the hospitals of Seoul. And so it was a crisis in Seoul for about al almost the whole summer of 20, 2015. And then a few other subsequent travel related cases of, uh, that went to um, Hong Kong, I believe, and, and even China. Uh, but it is, um, uh, it's still, um, we still see pockets of um, MERS outbreaks and the Middle East, but they're able to contain it fairly rapidly most of the time. Wow. And so we have this new virus. And so uh, COS, Co, the SARS-CoV-2, which is the name of the virus, SARS coronavirus 2, it's like the second SARS, <laughs> but that's, that's the nomenclature. So that's the name of the virus, SARS-CoV-2. But the name of the disease is COVID, C-O-V-I-D-19 as it, the disease occurred in 2019. And so it also is a coronavirus that um, um, we're not 100% certain, but we're extremely confident that the reservoir for the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 is the bat. In fact, a very specific species of, bat, of bats that were um, actually commonly found about 600 uh, kilometers, 900 kilometers away from Wuhan, China. We don't know if there's an intermediate host for that uh, SARS-CoV-2, um, but somehow it jumped from the bat into a human, and it appears to be just a single spillover event. And what I mean by spillover is many of these emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic. What does zoonotic mean? That means they're, they started in animals and spilled over into humans. And so this appears to be a single spillover event, event from a bat, maybe an intermediate animal host into humans, but it became easily transmissible from human to human once it spilled over into humans. So now that's why we have you know, human to human transmission. We don't see any evidence of continued spillover from an animal or a bat. But it's, now it's spillover easily transmissible from human to human. And that's why we have the pandemic that we have. We didn't stop it early enough. If we could have stopped it early enough, we might have prevented the pandemic. My goodness, that's how it all gets started. So yeah. the next uh, question is, oh, I guess you already answered it. I, I was questioning, how did it differ from things we've seen? So I guess like... It just yeah, and, it, and um, you know, so that that's how it's different with say the other coronaviruses, but maybe a, an important thing, differences and similarity, uh, I think is, is important because this is a pandemic. Um, in the last hundred years, we have only had uh, four other pandemics in the last hundred years. But all the other pandemics were flu viruses caused by influenza viruses. And so coronavirus is not an influenza virus. They're both RNA viruses but they're, they're different from that perspective, but it is behaving similarly as a respiratory virus that easily transmits from person to person. So it's worth reviewing a little bit. In 1918 was a very catastrophic pandemic, almost a hundred years ago, a little bit more than a hundred years ago. And um, that pandemic caused by an H1N1 influenza virus, um, started in the spring, similar to COVID, started in the spring, oh, well, started in the winter, but we, we experienced it in the United States in the spring. Um, but it came back in the second wave in the fall of, of 1918, and it was a catastrophic second wave in, in the fall. And there was a corresponding third wave the next spring in 1919. So we've had, uh, in addition, and there was over anywhere from 40 million to 90 million people lost their lives in that 1918, 1919 pandemic across the world. It was catastrophic. And at the time there were only 1.5 billion million, well, 
billion people who lived on planet Earth. And so that was pretty cat catastrophic at that time. And um, there have been other pandemics. There was one in 1957, another flu pandemic. And then the 1968-69 the flu pandemic. And in 2009, we had the H1N1 2009 pandemic. All those were caused by flu. And every one of them had a second and a third wave after the initial wave. And so we don't know COVID-19 if we're gonna have a second or third wave in the next fall and then the following spring, but we must assume in our preparedness plans, we must assume that we will see a second wave and maybe a third wave in the fall and next spring. Wow, so um, I was wondering, what, what did the governments do to respond to those previous pandemics that happened? Like, were they issuing quarantines like we have now? Well, 1918, you know, we, did, we, we didn't even know viruses existed. Viruses had not even been it, it discovered in, in 1918. <laughs> and, you know, we, we were just discovering the modern era of, of uh, biology. And then, you know, we were ju really just in the infancy of the germ theory. Uh, and but it's quite interesting in the 1918 flu there's some really good lessons learned even from 1918 that we're applying today and so it's very instructive of what happened in 1918 in some cities in the United States for example we talk a lot now about social distancing closing schools staying out of public places and so forth and there's two really good examples the city of Philadelphia um, did not waited real late to, to start closing schools and, and closing businesses and staying home and sheltering place. And they were hit very hard by the flu virus. They had catastrophic loss of life and illness in, in Philadelphia. St. Louis, on the other hand, actually um, began very early in their community closing schools limiting gathering in public places, sheltering in place. They didn't call it that then, but there was a clear distinction of what happened in 1918 between St. Louis and Philadelphia. And, and, and the data show that St. Louis su suffered far fewer deaths and serious illness because of the measures that they took in their community versus Philadelphia. And it's a, you know, it was simple and basic as, is staying away from other people. Um, <laughs> to exactly. limit transmission of the, it's that simple. And so um, 20, 2009 is more, you know, illustrative. And um, there was some social distancing in 2009, um, but as it turned out, um, the virus was not as severe as we first thought about. Oh. So the severity was, was not, as, not as bad. Um, it looked like it was gonna be bad when we first started seeing cases in Mexico um, in the spring of 2009. But as the virus circulated around the world, we weren't seeing as severe disease as we anticipated. So it was not necessary to implement community-wide social distancing measures. Some communities did. I know in Texas, <clears throat> there were some schools that closed. There were some, you know, large gatherings were closed, like football games in some communities were suspended for a little bit. So there was some, but not widespread, um, you know, community met in a, uh, social distancing measures like we're doing today. It wasn't necessary then. It, okay. it was today. Wow. All right. So it is and really important. Yeah. And quarantine's an interesting question too. Yeah. Is it, because um, we did implement a federal quarantine early on. Huh. And, um, and, the fed and, and quarantine is really a state law, not a federal law primarily. Yeah. And so President Trump actually did implement a federal quarantine and the secretary of HHS on the 30th of January or the 1st of February, I don't remember the exact date, but in the January, early February, the first time a federal quarantine was imposed was this year. And the last time it was imposed was almost 60 years ago during the smallpox eradication campaign. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it's, it's quite interesting. And so we imposed a federal quarantine to, um, it was actually at the federal level, you can impose a quarantine of something coming into the United States. Hmm. And so what we did is when we repatriated United States citizens from Wuhan, from China 
And we also repatriated citizens from the uh, cruise ship that was in Tokyo. Yeah. We quarantined those citizens before they went home. And so that was the, the basis of this federal quarantine is they were repatriated to the United States. They were housed on military bases and quarantined for 14 days to make sure that they were no longer sick before they went back to their home and into their community. I guess this leads well into the third question. How well do you think the U.S. is responding now to the pandemic? Um, very good question. And there's a lot of heated discussion of, about how well the United States is, has, has responded to the question. And, and, and first and foremost, you know, I, like, I like to say that we should wait till this is all over mm -hmm. before we do all the after action, because a lot of the conversation right now is, has, become, has become politicized and that's not helpful. Mm -hmm. And, and um, it's just really not helpful. At the moment, we're in a crisis and we all need to be working together to figure out how we get out of this crisis and, and the finger pointing that's already starting. It's natural. We always do it. Every time there is a crisis, no matter what, there's going to be finger pointing. And, and some of it, you know, we need to do that because you know, that's how we make, that's how we get better is to understand where we, we didn't do as well so we can do better the next time. And so a lot of the conversation, unfortunately, um, has, has become politicized and it's counterproductive. And so it's thinking about how we go, go forward. But this is how I do believe that, you know, the administration, I will still answer your question, given that. But I will keep it out of the, you know, the political box. So I'll stay in my science and public health box and policy box. We were really blinded. The, the real lesion here is we were really blinded. Our situational awareness was not what it could have been. And the lesion comes from the government of China. And it's clear now that, that, um, that there were early cases as early as November. And there were certainly cases um, in mid-December. The, the, the government of China did notify, as they should, and they are legally obligated, the World Health Organization on the 31st of December, that there was a cluster of unusual pneumonia in Wuhan, excuse me, Wuhan, China. Earlier, uh, there were some brave physicians that were also trying to alert their colleagues, other physicians of this unusual pneumonia okay. that we need to be on the lookout. And they were also trying to alert scientists and colleagues that they knew internationally. You know, unfortunately, some of these brave young physicians and scientists were admonished by the government of China. And um, you know, that was kind of egregious, uh, to, in my perspective, very egregious. And in the government of China was also saying as, as, as late as the third week in January, that there was no evidence of human to human transmission when there was clearly evidence of human human transmission. And then, and then when the Wuhan was locked down on the 23rd of January, and then that was 11 million people, it was unprecedented. A complete lockdown of 11 million people. That shocked me. That shocked a lot in the international community. It shocked a lot of people in the United States. What's going on? And then, and then a few, couple of days later, the whole province of Hubei was locked down. 60 million people were locked down. And that's, you won't do that if there's, unless there's extreme human to human transmission. But unfortunately, by the time they took, you know, unfortunately, the Chinese, the government of China took that extraordinary action to do that, to try to limit the the spread of the virus. Unfortunately, the virus was already on the move. It had already left China. It was already, you know, there were already seeds in Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, um, South Korea, Italy, and uh, in the United States as well. So the, the virus was already on the move. But fortunately, they did lock that down because that did limit the transmission within China. And then government um, and then the United States also took an unprecedented action just a, a week later which is lightning speed in the United States government interagency. We took unprecedented action as well. And this is good that we did it, but it was unprecedented and criticized when it, was, when it happened, that we also um, closed our border to China. We imposed very strict travel bans and restrictions of, um, uh, 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 of foreign nationals in China in the United States for the purpose of slowing the spread 
of the virus in the United States. It was already on the move, but the more we can slow, the more time we have to prepare. So that was the, that was the theory. So that was unprecedented and a very, very good move, move by the United States government, despite the criticisms that we got around the world, even from the WHO for taking such, such an action, but it was a good, good response. The next day, the Secretary of HHS declared a public health emergency for the United States, and that set in motion a lot of things and new authorities to begin our, our process of, of preparing. And then, you know, not only the U.S. government, uh, it, it, we're, we're, we're mistaken if we think the U.S. government can, um, is on, the only one that's responsible for, for preparing and responding to a pan pandemic. Pandemics will affect every community in the United States. And so think of it like having a Cat 5 hurricane hitting at least 10 cities at once, or at least in a month period, plus, plus another 20, 30, 40 Cat 2 hurricanes at the same time over a two month period. So there's no way the federal government can respond to that. You know, it, it, this takes team, it's, it's team sport, but that's the analogy, that's an analogy. Mm -hmm. And so we all have responsibilities. The federal government's got a responsibility, state governments have responsibility, our local governments respons have responsibilities, our industries, the private sector, our universities, and you, are, you and I as individuals have responsibilities in a, in a pandemic response. So overall, I, I believe our, 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 all of our governments have done well under the circumstances that we were blinded at first until it was our, you know, almost too late. And so I've never seen anything like the industrial mobilization that has happened in, in the United States uh, that is happening right now with the COVID-19 response. Who would have ever thought automobile manufacturers would pivot to make ventilators? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how many, it's amazing how many universities are, are turning out uh, 3D printing circuits for these ventilators, plus making N95 masks and learning how to decontaminate N95 masks because we're, we don't have a supply chain because most of them are manufactured in, in China. And so the innovation and the industrial mobilization has been nothing but from, other than phenomenal. Now, we could have done a better job communication wise. I think if anything, that's where we 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 um, we we need to do much better in communication. Uh, it always happens in a disaster. We we are never good at communication, and we're never good, particularly in an infectious disease outbreak. That's one of our weak spots, and it's difficult because infectious diseases are extremely complex. They're difficult to communicate. Our elected officials don't understand them, and the public doesn't understand it. You know, even I, I'm a scientist, and I have a I have a difficult time translating it. And so it, it's a hard communication challenge, but I think where we, where we really, where we really um, um, should have done better was early on, we minimized the risk. We, we just minimized the risk and we knew the risk was probably, um, well, it was hard for us to really know what the risk was because we didn't have situational awareness. Um, but nonetheless, we minimized the risk. Earlier on, we were seeing that that uh, fortunately is the example of how we minimize it. Fortunately, we were seeing early on, and it still holds true today, that at least 80% of the people who get infected, they're mild symptoms. And so we focused on the mild, which is you know, to try to make everybody feel good, as opposed to we need to think about those who get serious illness. And so even though 80% were mild, and, and many of those were asymptomatic. The fact is 20% were requiring hospitalization. Wow. And 15% of those required severe, I mean, like ICU, intensive care. Um, and five of those, 5% required ventilatory support. And so those, even though most people were mild and, and not hit hard, there was a, a relatively high percent that required serious care in the hospital. So we didn't communicate that. We didn't communicate the risk very well up front. And, and part of that's because we didn't understand the risk yet. Yeah, yeah we and, all need to put others' needs before our own. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and then the other thing where I think we, I don't call it a failure, but I do call it a strategic disappointment. And that's our testing. That's where we really dropped the ball early on is the technical difficulties, failures that the CDC had in testing. And we haven't caught up yet. We're doing better, but the laboratory diagnostics and testing was a huge 
strategic disappoint, disappointment. So where we could do better is communication and testing. Yeah. And that's kind of still true today. <laughs> yeah. I heard about some testing coming from South Korea. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know anything about that? Sure, yeah. And you know why South Korea did better than we did? Why? Lessons learned. They still remembered their MERS experience in 2015. Oh, wow. You know, so, and same with Taiwan. They still remembered their star, SARS experience in 03. Mm -hmm. And um, so SAR, they, they still remembered. And, and see, we, we always knew, our, you know, I think our political leaders and policymakers, they, they knew, okay, we're, we might have an infectious disease sometime. The American public, you know, they, I don't think really cared. That was something that happens over there somewhere. And so that's why it wasn't top of mind. Uh, but South Korea was ready because they'd recently experienced it and they were prepared and they already had agreements with their public health, Korean CDC and their private sector. And so they ramped up their private sector extremely fast um, to be ready to do the diagnostics. And so they have a really good uh, biotechnology sector in South, South Korea. And that's, that's, you know, so they, they were prepared, they were experienced and um, they have good, they have a good biotechnology sector and they were, they relied much more on their private sector as opposed to their government lab, private sector, a, a Korean CDC lab. That was pivotal to do the kind of the uh, confirmation and, and do the initial assays, but they handed it over to their private sector real quick. Um, so what's some advice you would give to people like during this pandemic and um, yeah, just how to react and respond? Um, the, you know, we are all going to need to really pay attention very, very closely, continue to pay attention to good information. And the best information comes from our local <coughs> authorities, our lo local public health authorities. You really got to pay attention to, particularly as we're moving forward, to begin to reopen our economy and industry in a very measured, phase and safe way. Uh, the, the best information is going to come from your local public health authorities. Um, one problem that we, even though we have a pandemic, but we also have an infodemic, meaning there's a lot of bad information out there. Um, and so we have to discern the bad information from the good information and the best information is going to come from your local public health authorities. And so as we move forward and beginning to um, reopen our economy, in our industry, which we must do. We cannot stay sheltered in place forever. Our economy, we're already taking too many, we're taking severe hits to our economy. And that also has impacts on our mental health, public health and medical, in addition to everything else. And so we've got to learn, we've got to mitigate the risk of COVID-2, of SARS-CoV-2 virus and COVID disease. So we have to mitigate that risk. We have to mitigate these other risks. And so we, we have to move forward in reopening our economy in, in a measured way. And so our individual responsibilities, social distancing is not gonna go away. We're just gonna lift the most restrictive measures like force shelter in place and force restriction movements. But social distancing is here with us for a while. Mm -hmm. And that really means just social separation from people. And so we're still for a while gonna have to avoid large gatherings when we do, do go into community. We need to be wearing face coverings because we now know that people can spread the virus and not even know they're sick. Mm. And so wearing a face covering can, can limit um, shedding the virus if you don't even know you're sick to other people. So face coverings are gonna become a new normal, mask in, in public. So we, we are going to need to wear and we should wear a mask and your local public health authorities are gonna, gonna tell you that. Um, we, as individuals, we need to, do everything we can to avoid being exposed and avoid exposing others, um, even if we're asymptomatic and don't know we're sick. You need to wash your hands frequently, disinfect surfaces, avoid touching your face. Everything that we've been talking about that you've been you know, learning. So you need to make sure that you wash your hands frequently with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Uh, you need to practice cough and sneeze etiquette. Um, and um, you need to uh, make sure you do everything you can to avoid getting sick and avoid making others sick, even if you don't know you're sick, because you could be in a, I think I, I may have lost, I, I, um, we'll let that phone stop ringing. <laughs> um, 
Well, that's kind of it. You know, you need, need to, you know, take on, we all are going to have individual responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And um, there, I, I know that, that many are going to be fearful as we begin to reopen our economy and, and industry. There's, um, <laughs> so we, we, we are going to be, be fearful. You know, and unfortunately, there are going to be some that want to just flip a switch and return back to our old normal. That's not realistic. We are going to have a new normal. Um, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what the new normal will look like again, but it's going to include a lot of social separation, social distancing in our, as we go out in our, in our community. And businesses, I'm, I'm convinced, are going to innovate in ways we can't even think about now because yeah. they want to open up their businesses in a way it's going to be safe to their customers. Yeah, for sure. So what would you say to the people that are protesting the lockdown and don't think coronavirus is real? The ones that are pro the protesting that, that uh, think that we ought to flip the switch and... Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, everybody has a right to protest. I mean, that is one of our, that is one of our you know, freedom of speech and constitutional rights. You know, I, I guess if, if, they're, if they wish to protest like that, um, I, I wish they would. I wish they would practice social, separ physical separation with their other protesters and wear a mask. <laughs> be kind to others and. Like, yeah, and be kind to others. Yeah, absolutely. Express our absolutely. rights, but then also abide. We're all going to have different feelings. We're all coming at this from a different perspective. Yeah. And and I understand the protest. Yeah. Because you know the it, it's our economy is is suffering significantly yeah. and that's not it, it's not sustainable you know the the other unintended consequences with with the economic impacts are just not sustainable so i understand i understand the protest um and, and i also understand you know um the other side of the story of it's too soon i'm afraid to go out in my community it's way too soon we're not where we ought to be yet so they're they're both valid arguments um, you yeah, know, but, but the, you know, the reality is, unfortunately, we're going to have to learn how to live with the virus. And that, that means that, you know, we're, we're going to have to walk slow, take baby steps as we learn how to live with the virus in a way that mitigates risk as, as much as possible. And I think this is another communication challenge. Um, the American public needs straight talk about risk. We can't eliminate the risk of COVID-19, um, but we, we can try to mitigate the risk. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there will, be, there will be people who get infected as we are, we should, we will, we should inspect and expect, and we do anticipate we're gonna see a rise in cases as we do begin to open our economy. I'd be shocked if that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, but that's why we have to be prepared with our, our testing, contact tracing. We have to do everything we can to box the virus in so we avoid a dangerous resurgence of, of, of mortality. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Here at home in Maryland, things have been about as chaotic as the world around us. Maryland confirmed three cases of the virus on March 5th and declared a state of emergency. At that time, the public was not entirely aware of the risks and effects quite yet. However, many people saw the risk of COVID-19 as a threatening reality when Governor Hogan issued the closing of schools at least two, for at least two weeks, with schools being conducted online, and then the two weeks being extended until the end of May. This happened on March 13th. This followed with the governor closing close proximity businesses like gyms, movie theaters, and the dining portion of restaurants that could pose a risk for spreading coronavirus. The Maryland government began making serious actions. The governor issued an executive order to look at hospitals that were closed in hopes to find more spaces and allowed anyone with an out-of-state or in-state medical license, expired or effective, to be able to join the ranks of those fighting the virus and to practice medicine in Maryland. The big legislation came when Governor Hogan passed a bill to transfer all non-essential businesses to home. Gatherings of 10 or more were prohibited, and all Marylanders were advised to stay home 
only to go out for essential needs. Those who would not comply would be fined and have a forced quarantine imposed. The governor also applied for federal aid through a presidential disaster declaration for Maryland. All these actions surely rocked the boat. It showed that this virus was affecting all of us, not the, just those with compromised immune systems. Security measures ramped up and the state went into full quarantine. When Maryland was eventually closed to prevent the spread of the virus, many more concerns opened up. People began to protest in Annapolis about the government's restrictive and harsh actions. The bigger problem was that many people were out of work. How would those people provide food for their family? Would, were the government's actions stripping away our rights? What good could come out of this? Thankfully, Maryland, nor the whole world, was left in darkness. With such a terrible virus going on, and so many things happening, it's hard to find any hope. In order to find encouragement and the hope that we have in this, this dark, confusing time, I set out on a journey to find this hope. First, I talked to Katie Kalawa, Director of Youth Ministries at Hunt Valley Church, about how the church has responded and how we can respond to such a terrible thing like COVID-19. My name is Katie Callowan. I work at Hunt Valley Church. I am the high school ministry director there. i um, been there about three and a half, coming up on four years. Thank you for joining us. Um, first question, how has the church responded to the needs created by COVID-19? Yeah, one thing I really appreciate about Hunt Valley Church is that they are really passionate about saying, like, how can we serve our community? Um, we are... Um, we work really hard to try to be an others focused church, not just um, focus on just ourselves. Um, and so uh, kind of thinking through, okay, what was the response <laughs> like within those first few weeks, especially in March, um, when all this started going down, um, I think it was kind of, it ended up being kind of a threefold response. I don't even, I don't think it was that structured when we like started, <laughs> but in the end it kind of hit kind of three main areas. One uh, was transitioning everything to online to say, how can we continue to do ministry and create space for people to worship and to encounter God um, and to see lives transformed by Jesus? Um, and so uh, first step was kind of getting everything online. Uh, second step was saying, okay, what are the physical needs uh, that, we, uh, that are around us that we can meet? Um, and so we started um, actually like legitimately, so Thursday, or on a Thursday was when Governor Hogan shut down everything in Maryland. Um, and that next Friday morning, we were at Cothysville Middle School um, working with the people who run the food, uh, the food bank that's there. Um, and because the schools were closing, that meant the food bank was closing. And so we were like gathering a ton of food um, and connecting with the woman who runs it to say, okay, who are your families that normally are supported by this? Um, how can we get in touch with them? How can we continue to work together to help whoever might need it in this time? Um, so we were doing the food drive. Um, we have also been doing a couple blood drives because uh, that's a big need in our community right now as well. Um, so it was moving everything on online. It was trying to figure out what are the physical needs in our community. And then the third kind of main area was saying, who are, who are the people that, who are vulnerable or hurting during this time? And how do we provide uh, spiritual, emotional support <laughs> during all of that? Um, and so we started by um, looking at our own church population and saying, okay, who, who's at risk? Um, who is maybe uh, in more elderly? And so um, that was part of the risk demographic for sure. And so how are we reaching out to them um, or people who might have chronic illness or that sort of thing? Um, but then also saying, okay, who are our healthcare workers? <laughs> who are the people who are on the front lines of this? And how are we supporting them as well? Um, and so we have a whole team that's been, I mean, that's been calling shut-ins, that's been calling um, and keeping in touch with the healthcare workers. We have been sending um, meals to some of the, uh, some of our people who are working on COVID units. Um, we have 
um, a lot of our students and families have been sending in uh, photos and letters and um, posters to be able to uh, encourage those healthcare workers. So yeah, that's, that's been some of what we're doing. Yes. Um, next question is, how have you seen people respond to this crisis? Yeah, I think a lot of people's initial response was a lot of fear um, and a lot of anxiety and just a lot of um, just disorientation, I guess is the best word for it. Um, none of us were expecting to be locked in our houses <laughs> at all, let alone for a little over a month. Uh, we're coming up on six or seven weeks now, something like that. Um, and so uh, just a lot of kind of disorientation and a lot of questions of saying, God, what are you, what are you doing in this? Where are you in this? What does this mean? What does this look like? Um, and so um, I think that has just been um, it, very natural. Um, and it honestly kind of makes a lot of sense that those are the questions that people are asking. Um, but it's been interesting kind of walk, watching people like a like grow through this and uh, see how the questions are kind of changing and shifting. And um, I would say now uh, there's a lot of, uh, the fear and anxiety is less, I mean, it still is around the disease, but now it's kind of shifted into more of an economic nature. Um, and so people are trying to figure out, okay, what, what does life look like after this? Um, what, uh, how are we able to provide for our families? Um, what, does, what does it look like living in the aftermath of, something like COVID-19 um, and um, yeah, then all of these questions while they uh, come off as just kind of either personal or financial or something like that, like really they're deeper level spiritual questions too. Um, and so um, yeah, it's just been really interesting watching people kind of wrestle and saying, okay, what, what does this mean for me? Uh, what do I do with this? How do I grow from this? How do I um, I know one question I've been asking a lot is like, how do I become a healthier person because of all of this? Um, personally, but also spiritually, like how am I growing during this time? Um, and I think a lot of people are asking similar questions there too. How has the help provided by the church and God helped change people's views on this whole thing? Yeah, I think, um, I think a lot of people are searching during this time. Um, I think there are a lot of people um, outside of our church community who are trying, like this just brings up a lot of big life questions and big life questions are spiritual questions. Um, and it's all about purpose and meaning and all those sorts of things. And we have answers in that in Jesus. Um, and I think people in the community are, are kind of wrestling with some of this. And so the families that we've been able to intersect with, um, especially through the food drive, um, it's been really fascinating being able to kind of see them watching what we're doing with this and saying, okay, most people aren't helping in this way. Um, like a lot of people are kind of sheltering in place. A lot of people are, um, it's really easy to be selfish in a time like this of saying like, I need to just provide for my needs and focus there. Um, all kind of reasonable responses, uh, yet for us as a church to say, no, like who are people that we can go out and help during this time? Um, it kind of gives people a little bit of a different perspective on what the church maybe is or is about. Um, and so I see a lot of people kind of wrestling with that. Um, within our church, I would say we, um, the, the kind of switching to this online model um, has, been a big gift <laughs> to a lot of them in terms of being able to still be connected and still find ways to uh, be in worship and be in community. Um, and we are, we're definitely seeing growth through that. Um, but I also would say that we're still very much in the middle. <laughs> and so uh, the story's not over. And so there's a lot we're going to see on the, on the back end, looking back in five, 10 years, um, that we can say, oh, wow, look at all the ways that people grew from COVID-19. Um, that we're in the middle of doing it right now. So it's kind of hard to, hard to identify exactly. How have you personally responded to COVID-19? Yeah, I'll be honest, right? It has been challenging. Um, so I uh, live by myself. Um, and so I have spent this whole quarantine in uh, an apartment just with me. <laughs> and uh, I think everybody's situation is really different these days. Um, but that's been challenging for me to be like, okay, like I can talk to myself 
um, and God, and that's about it. <laughs> and I mean, obviously we've got digital connection like this, but um, yeah, so it's been a lot of wrestling with um, one kind of recognizing and seeing in a new way the value of community um, and the value of saying, no, like we were not created to be isolated and we were not created to be self-sustaining. Like we were created to lean on other people, to be interdependent with other people. Um, and so definitely been learning about that. Um, I also think that this whole situation kind of exposes a lot of things in a lot of people really fast. Um, I think we uh, have all been kind of thrust into um, not necessarily our best version of ourselves <laughs> in terms of uh, fear and anxiety just tends to bring out the not so great sides of people. Um, and, and with that, in some ways, that's kind of a gift to be able to say, okay, there's stuff there that I need to work on and I need to grow in. Um, it, I think it exposes a lot of your own insecurities um, and the things that you, um, you're really fearful of or the places where you're really putting your trust in inside, instead of God. Um, and it, it challenges you to say, okay, is this how you want to live long term? Like the, I fully believe that the patterns and the habits we're developing now in this season, um, are going to be ones we take with us when we get back out into normal life, whatever that looks like. Um, I mean, what they say it takes what, six weeks to develop a habit yeah. We're six weeks in. So <laughs> like what habits have we made that intentional or not? And so, um, yeah, what is that? I kind of, like I said earlier, I just keep asking myself, what does it look like to use this time intentionally? Um, but then also, what does it look like to give myself so much grace during this season? Like none of us have ever lived through a pandemic before. <laughs> none of us know how to do this. We're all trying to figure this out. Um, and so what does it look like to, in some ways say, okay, where do I need to push myself and say, okay, you're trusting in the wrong places. You're um, not responding in a way that is reflective of who Jesus is and you, that's what you want to do. So you need to grow in these areas, but then also say, all right, uh, this is hard and nobody knows really how to do this. And so there is grace for this moment too. Last question. What is some advice or encouragement you would give to others at this period in time? Yeah, I advice or encouragement. I would say if you don't know who Jesus is, this is a great time to look him up. Um, to say uh, that I am so confident that the the hope that we have that we keep talking about uh, is found in Jesus alone. And so, um, if this is if you have not really explored scripture, if you've not really um, asked some of the questions that are kind of deep down that you know you're asking, but you just haven't made time to really wrestle with, now's a great time to do so. Um, and just to say, okay, how can we take advantage of this season? Not to necessarily become the most productive person ever, not necessarily to become super fit or to make all the new recipes or to, to seize the day or whatever, but to say, okay, like you've got space. Like when was the last time you had space and some margin in your life? Uh, this is a gift from God. Um, and so what does it look like to use that margin and let him fill it rather than let you try to fill it? Um, and what might he be doing in that time and in that space or what might he want to do in that time and space? Thanks so much. For yeah, time. no problem. See ya. Churches and nonprofits around the world have stepped up to help those in need. The homeless, the jobless, the refugees, and everyone in between. When everyone else sees life as short and confusing, and people are out of work and struggling for their lives, those whose hope is in the risen Christ Jesus have had the opportunity to share what hope looks like, whether it's providing a meal, talking, providing money, or even just plain encouragement. As a Christian, the greatest hope there is, is the hope of eternity with God. We have seen this in the church as we worship God as one, despite not having a building to worship in, and continuing to focus on others' needs. The world still has suffering, but with God, those who trust in Him and look forward to eternity and do that by helping others see this hope.
In addition to the church's response, we have seen communities and businesses alike step in to care for the world. Companies like Lego and 3M have made masks and shields to protect the doctors and nurses who give their lives to help others. Amazon has provided $7 million to help communities affected by the virus, and AT&T has waived internet costs for healthcare employees for the work they've done. For those who cannot provide food, m and Bank Stadium in Baltimore has opened up to provide that food, and countless other food drive, drives have opened up to provide food for the homeless and those who can't afford it, with donations pouring in from churches and individuals. Food has been an important topic in this pandemic, as the main reason people venture out of their homes is to replenish their supply. I talked to Chris Johnson, who works at a small chain of grocery stores called Growl Supermarkets, about what conditions have been like for the grocery stores and how the stores are helping in the virus. My name's Chris Johnson. I'm an employee at a grocery store called, Growl, called Growl's Market. All right. Um, first of all, how has COVID-19 affected working conditions at grocery stores? Um, you know, at the beginning, when all this was first happening, it was kind of hard to get used to everything because there were so many people coming in and we were just getting crushed. But now that everybody's kind of used to it and it's slowed down a lot, it's easier to handle and I'm not under as much stress. Next, uh, how have you seen people's reaction to the pandemic in working conditions and in people's activities and habits at the store? Well, I know this sounds weird, but everybody's sort of moving a little faster. Everybody seems like they want to get in and get out really quick. So yeah. I don't know if that's actually what's happening. It might just be my perception of it, but people do seem to be kind of running through the stores. How have stores like Grouse implemented safety precautions to help prevent the spread of disease and in dense conditions like in the grocery stores? Yeah, we have. Um, obviously, we're all required to, to wear uh, masks now. And um, a lot of people were doing that even before Governor Hogan requested it. And um, all of our aisles are one way. So each while, each aisle is alternating going up and down the store. So people aren't really face to face very much. And then I'm sure you've seen those big screens up next to all the cash registers. If you've been out to any stores at all to block the germs from getting to the cashiers and from the cashiers. Uh, next, what are some ways your store and you personally have helped others during this time? Um, well, I just sort of try to keep everybody calm. If somebody runs up to me with like an urgency to get something and get out, I usually use like a calming tone or something. I know that sounds kind of silly, but I think it, because if you make people feel like they're going to be safe, then they act a lot better. That's good. Um, last question. What is some advice you would give to people and how can they help others who maybe can't afford food in the challenging conditions? Um, well, for the people that can't afford enough food, I'd just say ask a neighbor, ask a friend, ask a parent or a sibling or anybody really, because I know my family and other people around us in our community are very open to helping people who are in need. And as a word of encouragement, God's with us. We're going to get through this. Everybody in the history of the world has gotten through everything else. So there's no reason why this shouldn't turn out the same way. That's so great. Thanks. All right. Thanks. I'll see you later. It is important to put others first, as Jesus says in the Bible, to help comfort those who don't know what to do. This is exactly what Chris and other people are doing. As the virus grows stronger, the people have fought back. We have adapted and adjusted to our current circumstances in order to come together and fight as one. But we wouldn't be anything without the delivery workers, doctors, nurses, and grocery store employees who have worked tirelessly to do their part in stopping COVID-19. The doctors and nurses have given up living with their families at home in order to help those in need. They have risked death from the virus itself. The same for other workers 
like grocery store workers and those making deliveries. All these have shown what it means to help others and do their part. They have done more than could be asked of them. And in the hardship of it all, they have made the most of it. As we the people have placed others' needs above our own, we see more and more good come out of the darkness of COVID-19. We have seen the elderly recover from viral infection, teachers providing support for their students, even celebrities have stepped up and helped to share the hope in this time, such as actor John Krasinski, who started his own news network via YouTube called SGN, which stands for Some Good News. People have at home, people at home have made masks by the dozen for those who need them, like the healthcare workers. Children have put up street chalk to encourage others. Because of the efforts of everyone of these people, we have hope for reopening. The curve of the virus is flattening. States like Maryland have received improved testing from South Korea, and many others are doing their part by staying home and setting precedents that speak volumes. So, what do I think of all this? Well, it's been hard. At the beginning, I thought the virus was just something far off in China, but it turned out to be way more than that. The reality came crashing down when schools closed. I remember feeling devastated. That night, I talked with my best friend. He and I exchanged thoughts about the whole thing. We were both so confused. Suddenly, just like that, everything changed. But even still, we didn't forget that we know the God whom the wind and waves obey, and that he's the same God here in our midst to help us through our troubles. Even as the virus entered my country, my state, and even my county, I've remembered and come to grips with the fact that this world is not my home. Because of this, my faith in Jesus Christ has been strengthened, especially during Holy Week when the virus hit hard. I was encouraged to read from the Bible. That allowed me a world of encouragement. I became excited and joyful about the hope that is the death and resurrection of Jesus, and the fear sort of melted away. In addition to this, my church has acted as an encouragement to so many in this time. We have collected donations, connected for Bible study, even over the internet, and been praying together for God to be glorified and for his hope and peace to rest in each person. It has encouraged me to know that I'm not alone. With this in mind, I began to live my life with more hope. Nevertheless, it was still crazy and heartbreaking whenever we heard of people dying or people we know suffering from the virus. That's the thing about world crises. They have ups and downs. In World War II, the world suffered under fascist regimes. Heck, France fell to the Axis powers before the victory was won. The same thing is true now. We have our downs, but we have confidence that things will get better. At home, in response to the virus, everything transferred to online education. This was a strange step, but thankfully it worked well for me. In addition to that, my acting group took it a step further and postponed our spring musical and instead filmed movie adaptations of poems to lighten the hearts of the folks at nursing homes we visit at Christmas time. That encouraged me. I thought, even when the world is falling apart, we still have joy. I began to take many long walks to reflect and see all that we still have. As I walked, I was able to see how others are doing from a social distance and gained more peace and understanding. My community has done so much to comfort others with chalk drawings and community art boards. Those have provided a lot of hope in this dark time. When the quarantine was issued, I helped my dad transport his video production business 
to our house. That was a sure blessing that my st dad still had a job and a business. Things were tough the first few weeks, but God provided jobs for my dad to make COVID-19 announcements and build websites for people. It felt strange to have COVID-19 in every aspect of my life, but we came through. My family spent lots of time together. However, it's been tough, and there were many times when we felt super stressed. I realized that I have many things to work on in my own life. Many times I've gotten angry at my family, chose to waste time rather than use it, and have often put my needs first. This pandemic has shown me that the needs of others are greater than my own needs, and that it is my duty to help and to set good precedents. Even when I become annoyed with the quarantine, I know that the government is trying to slow the spread, and the more we listen, the sooner the virus will be stopped. Also, I'm reminded that so many other people, especially the doctors and nurses, are giving up so much more than me and the least I can do is to do the best I can to stop the spread. I think about what this pandemic will mean for the future. Honestly, who knows what the future will bring? We can see that the world has been kickstarted into massive technological normalization and advancement. The fact that basically all, or at least most, of our business and schooling have been done online is something that will continue to develop, probably. Another thing is that our nation and its people need to prepare for other events like this. It was hard for the U.S. to implement these measures, and many people pushed back. But we need to remember that fighting a pandemic is top priority. What is most clear of all, though, is that we must hold these lessons that we've learned about faith, love, fear, selflessness, and hope with us. When we think back to COVID-19 and what it did, we should remember those we lost with contrite hearts. And we will show that this virus did not break our spirits, did not ruin our lives beyond repair, but that it brought us closer together, showed that people have good in them, that we are willing to do our part in helping others and that at every stage of hopelessness during the darkness of COVID-19, we never were without hope.